Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, unschooling mom and author, bringing you interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free Exploring Unschooling ebook, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hi everyone, I'm Pam Larickia and this is episode number five of the podcast. It's the 3rd of February 2016 as I record this intro. In this episode, I asked Sandra Dot, a veteran unschooling mom, 10 questions about unschooling. It was a wonderful conversation and I had a great time chatting with her. I hope you find it interesting and enjoyable too. Before we get started, a quick update on life around here. This last week, I've been focusing on getting a project up and running that I'll be able to share with you next week. I'm really excited about that. I'm also enjoying the routine of our days lately. And Joseph and I have a couple of things around the house that we plan to tackle this weekend. So things are well. And on to this week's quote. I thought it would be appropriate to use one of my favorite Sandra Dodd quotes this week. If your child is more important than your vision of your child, life becomes easier. Isn't that beautiful? First, it encourages us to realize that we might be holding an idealized vision of the perfect child in our minds. And it immediately follows that up by asking us to consider whether our challenges may lie in the fact that we're trying, maybe even unconsciously until now, to mold our child to match that vision. Our days really are easier when we instead choose to see the real child who stands before us and to help that person do the things they want to do, rather than the things we wish they wanted to do. I really love the simplicity and the depth of that quote. If you have any thoughts you'd like to add, just head on over to livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast and share in the comments for episode five. And one quick note before we move into the interview. Uh, the inter- the internet was a bit finicky, and I didn't manage to record the short intro, so we jumped directly into the first question. But no worries, I can give the intro here. <laughs> Sandra Dodd is a longtime unschooling mom of three, Kirby, Marty, and Holly, who are now adults. She's also the creator of the awesome unschooling resource, SandraDodd.com. I have 10 questions for you, Sandra, so let's dive right in. I've always loved your short essay, Rejecting a Prepackaged Life. I've linked to it in my Intro to Unschooling Materials for years, and I'll link to it in the show notes for listeners. I'm pretty sure I came across it way back in 2002, and the paradigm shift that you talk about was both fundamental and inspiring at the beginning of my unschooling journey. Can you talk a bit about that shift? Well, I think my original intention was to suggest that people should turn away from schoolish sort of competitive frustrations where what they really want out of life is to be better than, bigger than, faster than the neighbors, their friends, and and to help them see that really, especially when they have young children, and I was coming out of La Leche League in those days from being around people who said, just be gentle, just be sweet with your child, hold him. So I was thinking if parents, even as their children are getting older, could find ways to find joy in simple little things now and often that it would just make their whole lives better, not just their life with their children, but their own. Um, the URL that I that I made for that essay when I put it online was just sandradod.com slash joy. I didn't call it rejecting a prepackaged life. I always think of that as joy. And the word joy is in there a lot. And I talked about, uh, well, can I read a piece? Yeah, sure. This is just two paragraphs near the bottom. If you practice noticing and experiencing joy, if you take a second out of each hour to find joy, your life improves with each remembrance of your new primary goal. You don't need someone else to give you permission or to decide whether or not what you thought gave you joy was an acceptable source of enjoyment. Can learning be fun? If it's not fun, it won't stick. Can laundry be fun? If you have to do laundry and you choose not to enjoy it, an hour or more of your precious hours on earth have been wasted. Can looking at your child bring you joy even when he needs a bath and has lost a shoe and hasn't lived up to some expectation that only exists in your mind? If not, a paradigm shift could help you both. So that's what I was saying is just change change your focus in life, which sounds easy, but it's not. (laughs) So in the years since then, there have been a lot of examples 
of people and families who came through came through unschooling discussions and conferences and gatherings who said that really had helped them too so that i'm solidly confident in that little piece of writing i like it yeah i mean it was it made such a big impact on me when when i realized all those things boiled down to if i just focused on the joy and focused on them that everything else flowed so beautifully from that. And that that's actually, you know, how I came up with my website name way back in 2004, Living oh, Joyfully. It was oh, because of that focus. <laughs> <laughs> when people ask me, well, what do I have to do? What do I have to do to be an unschooler? They just want a quick answer, right? Um, yeah. Lately, I say, go to your site and get your introduction. That's That's made my life a lot easier. So thank you for writing that. <laughs> but the answer is really about how to become an unschooler. You can't just not be an unschooler and go and do unschooling. Yeah. So it involves changing the parent's attitude and thought and awareness, and it's gradual. So people get cranky about that, I think, for, for normal reasons, for understandable reasons. They feel like if they, just, if they declare themselves to be something and they go to the meetings and they pay the money you know, or whatever, that then they are that, like joining a club or – you know, buying a car, you know, you're a Toyota owner when you have the title to your Toyota. It's just not that easy to become an unschooler. But it is, it's a lot of little bitty things. So people think it's about who does it and what, where, but it, what it really is about is why. Why do you want to do this? Because you want to be happier, because you want your child's life to be gentler. And so when they start to see some of the why, then they can figure out the how by making choices that take them nearer to why. Yeah, and then and those choices are the ones that that work individually for their family, right? Because you can't just like you were saying, slap on, do this, this, and this. Right. We can't send yeah. them a schedule and say day one unschooling, do this. <laughs> <laughs> Might be easier yeah, no. if we could, but we can't. That would be a curriculum, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> but speaking of which, that leads very nicely into question number two. <laughs> Before you began unschooling, you were a teacher. So what were some of the challenges to learning that you saw in the classroom environment? Ah, challenges to learning. Well, there was a lot of learning happening for me because mm -hmm. I learned a lot about myself and I began to review my entire life. The very first year I was there, I was teaching remedial reading and I had always been top student, top group, and they had us uh, tracked when I was a kid. We were, I didn't know until later we were part of a test of a study. And we were a oh. school where everyone knew their scores and their standing. And then there were, I don't know where the other schools were or what the results of the study were or anything. All I know is that we were, the, we were that group. And then there were some other schools where they mixed them all up and they didn't know. So... I had, had only gone to school really with the brightest kids most of those years, and um, I thought when teachers liked me, I thought they liked me because I was a good student, because I got A's all those years I went to school. So here I was teaching seventh grade in the same building where I had been from second grade to ninth grade, and the kids I liked best, some of them couldn't read and were very slow thinkers and but were very sweet humans you know i just hadn't occurred to me so i just saw the world from a completely different angle um that first year and this sort of review of my life continued so it was very therapeutic for me and probably particularly because i was in the same buildings because later i taught where i'd gone to high school taught ninth grade there um, wow. and I was teaching with people who had been my teachers so people that I had seen from one perspective now I was seeing them from another perspective so I don't think there could have been any better learning environment for someone who really was interested in learning and teaching and, and education and you know that, all that I loved that stuff from the time I went to first grade I thought this is wow. where it's at yeah. <laughs> and now I think that's not that's not where it I changed what, <laughs> what for that it was. <laughs> there's a bigger it. So uh for the kids though, for those kids and the two kids I taught were twelve to fifteen over the years, I sometimes saw in them sorrow and frustration. So I just really didn't want to be there. Or they were so beat down by years of bad grades, frustration. I was teaching English too, so some kids just didn't like English, didn't like that reading and writing stuff. It wasn't where their, where their skills and their joy were. So I learned pretty early on to find out what those kids did like. There was one kid who was a great artist. And so when we did a um, project at Christmas, we did 12 Days of Christmas. So everybody else were doing things about 
math, how you know, figure out how you how many gifts that was with the formula, even though I was teaching English. Um, I would do mm-hmm. anything that got them sparked up, you know, they got them excited. Um, I cheated as a teacher, I suppose. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I did. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this, and they said, you know, this guy can 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 draw and paint. So he did poster boards of the of the Twelve Days of Christmas art, and it was great. Yeah. It was really good. So we went to all the other classrooms and did our little show. Each of my classes that we were, we were doing like a medieval, uh, what they call those things, morality plays, miracle plays that they used mm-hmm. to do like parades. They would go down the street and stop and do their play and go to the next one. So we were learning about that um, English literary. That was our, that was our excuse. It was you know, medieval literature, but mm-hmm. other, other things that the kids could do, I would just find them a way that they could do that. And that was fun for me because I was not doing what my teachers had done at all, partly because of my, of the training I'd had in alternative ed and partly just because it was there, because I saw it. I saw it, and mm-hmm. I thought, oh, this is way better. This is a better way to do it. Than, and I never used the books. When I, when I was teaching, I did not ever pull out those books. I would inventory them and tape the boxes shut and pile them in the back of the room and make my <laughs> own materials. But still, I burned out. Um, another thing I saw in those kids, though, was the effect of their lack of choices and their powerlessness. They didn't have an option to be there. They didn't have very much option about which class to be in. If they could pull off switching teachers or something, they just felt overly ecstatic. And I thought they shouldn't be that excited about something so simple and so basic. So every time they got a choice, every time they got a chance to act like a real person, act like a little bit like an adult and not a little kid, I saw them lift up like they got taller, their eyes brightened. And I was filing that. I didn't know for what. I knew it was something important. I think that school tries to keep the world small in a way. They want it. Mm-hmm. They want you to feel like they have it all in that building, in those books, and that all you have to do is just show up every day and do what they tell you, and you'll be prepared for everything in the whole world. Clearly, that wasn't true. So, by making that world small and contained, one thing that they did was they covered up the windows. If there were any windows low where you could see anything, they would either put student art on it or just black and orange construction paper, seasonal coverings for windows. And in a couple of classrooms I was in, they painted it, plain out got paint and painted the windows. The high ones were fine for letting light in because you couldn't see anything but trees. And that was so that the kids didn't look out the window and get distracted, so that the teacher could be the most interesting thing. I think that's also why the white teachers took away toys from kids and told them not to scribble, not to doodle. And now there are studies about how great doodling is for listening and paying attention. But at the time you could get in trouble for doodling because the teacher wanted to be the focus of attention. So one time I was speaking at a little conference in Long Beach, and I realized that the drapes behind me, uh, it was a a university classroom, um, kind of halfway underground, so that the window that was halfway up the wall was the ground. And there are people walking around out there in cars. It was a road within the university. And I opened all the drapes. And I told Uh people this thing about painted windows. You know, it wasn't part of my talk. I just thought, this is a really good opportunity. And I said, if what's happening outside the window is more interesting than what I'm saying, then you should pay attention to that. And when you're unschooling, your children should do what's the most interesting thing. They should do what seems best and what catches their attention because that's how they're going to learn. It's a little bit like the tightrope without a net, though, as teaching goes, because if I were responsible for a certain amount of material and I needed to test them and prove that I was doing my job to get paid and all like that, then that might be part of why the teachers want to do that too. So I was learning things about education and about teaching that no one had been talking about. And that was interesting for me too. I didn't know why I needed it. But just like with unschoolers' lives, when we look back and we see all of their interests coming together to form the thing that they do someday that's exciting Mm -hmm. or that they make a living with, you can't see it as you're going, but when you look back, you see it. So when I look back on my life as a kid in school and as a teacher, and when I quit teaching and how I felt about it when I quit, which was way before I had children, I see all of this rolling (laughs) crazily toward unschooling. But at the time, I had no idea, of course. Yeah, no, it's so cool to look back and see the threads, isn't it? It is. It is. Just recently, David Bowie died, and it so happens that when I was a kid, when I was 14, I had written him a a letter because I had an advanced copy of his first album, Mm -hmm. and he wrote back. He wrote a beautiful, beautiful letter back, and so when he died, that letter went crazy all over the world on on the Internet. One of my former students, 
who had kept up with me after she was out of school, knew where I was and all, wrote on her Facebook page that, that if anybody wasn't aware that this was – that I was their teacher because my name in those days was Gil. So oh, I necessarily yeah. picked that up. So some of my students came – that was last week, right? And uh, a couple of weeks ago and wrote some things that I thought I might want to share with you about this uh, – and it's disturbing to me, <laughs> disturbing to me because they were effusive and they missed me and they wished I'd kept teaching. Ah, uh, yeah. And one wrote, it's a little ironic to me that such a gifted teacher became an international advocate for unschooling. One of the few educators in Española who really taught and provoked interest in subjects beyond our little valley. And wow. one wrote... You influenced, you influenced many of us in very positive ways, and I'm glad after all these years to be in a position to say thank you. And uh, one, one boy I remember said, a good teacher. I remember her well. She used to show us films and sing ballads. Awesome. <laughs> wow, that is cool. It's cool, but, but I've so shut the door on those days. Because, yep. <laughs> when I, because after I quit teaching and I started getting involved with parenting, even before I knew we were going to unschool, I started to see how things that I had no choice to do, even though I was trying my best to be gentle and sweet and generous and alternative, still grades and comparisons and making them stay in there and do things they don't want to do, that hurts kids. And I mm -hmm. had no option. You can't be part of that system really and escape the fact that the kids who really don't want to be there are building up harsh memories and damage. Well, yeah, that I think, you know, you can really see how you talked about how you burnt out when you were doing that. It's because you were taking on so much of that structure, you know, and relieving them from that pressure just for a little bit, even in your class. So I think, you know, that's why you left such a great impression. But taking that on takes a toll, right? Yeah, I can't do that for 30 years, I guess. Yeah, I did it for six years. <laughs> All right, let's see. Question number three. When your children were young, I imagine that with three at home, sometimes conflicts arose. Can you share some of the ways that you approach them? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I imagine. <laughs> uh, we were in a uh, La Leche League playgroup. So it was, it was a, uh, I'm a babysitting co-op, playgroup, yes, but a babysitting co-op. So we had a really, really efficient system for how if the moms needed to do something, the kids would stay at one of the other parents' houses and we kept points and stuff. So one day there were about like six kids at my house, mine and three others, and they were playing with Fisher-Price farm, Fisher-Price toys, which are right in this room. I can see that barn from here <laughs> right at this moment. And so they're playing in the front room at our old house and they're having a good time. And then suddenly there was squealing and screaming and crying and yelling. And I rushed in there because I'd been in the kitchen and right around the corner, I rushed around the corner and was like, no, I want it. So it was this little farmer, this little Fisher Price farmer, the old kind of Fisher Price mm -hmm. with a little farm hat. And I could see that they were like really about to take the claws out to get this farmer. And I said, wait, wait, let me see it. So they handed it to me. So I looked at it and I said, this is what you guys want to play with? And they said, yes. And I you know, start telling me their stories. And I stuck it in my pocket and said, let's eat first. Mm -hmm. So I was proud of that. I was glad that I thought to, you know, hold him, show him, let them know I realized what the problem was, and then to get them out of there. Mm -hmm. After lunch, so while they're eating, I'm thinking, now we have to figure out the really, you know, wise Solomon way to get this guy back in the game. They didn't want him. Nobody wanted him after lunch. They're going to go do something else. <laughs> so that was a good lesson for me, too. Sometimes if you just diffuse the situation, it, it totally d dissolves. It's gone. Mm -hmm. And so maybe they were hungry. Maybe, I don't know. But, it, but it, that, was, that was a resolution that I didn't expect. Mm -hmm. But I, so I took that piece of information, and sometimes later on, if there were things I thought they were going to fight over or not take good care of, I would let that be my toy. If there was mm -hmm. a toy they really wanted, but I thought, oh, it's fragile and it's going to cause a problem. I said, well, I'll buy it and it'll be mine. You guys can use it. So that way, anytime there was an argument, I'd say, I'm afraid you're going to break it. Let's put it up. That was a little bit mm -hmm. helpful. Uh, we had the I I don't know. I should say, shouldn't say we in this case because I don't know if Keith even thought about it very much. <laughs> Keith was the youngest of three and I was the oldest of, in my family yeah. of two or four. We had some cousins come to live with us. 
So I always understood Kirby's point of view totally, and Keith always felt more for Marty and Holly, which makes sense, I suppose. Every Everyone's factors, everyone's history is an honest and legitimate part of how they see the world. Yeah. So I used to tell my kids, instead of that sort of song that some parents sing about, you have to love your brother because he'll be your brother for the rest of your life, and nah, 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 nah. <laughs> when we're gone, it's all your family. You know, oh, I hated that when I was a kid. You have to love your sister. I don't think so. Eventually I did, <laughs> but I didn't want to do it because somebody told me to, or made exactly. me. So what I used to say is, you know what, just get along with them while you live here because when you're grown, you never have to see them again. You can move to another continent. You don't even have to call them. Mm-hmm. And in a way that gave them hope, like this, all these problems are temporary. And when they were grown, they did like each other and they've paid money to visit each other in other states. It hasn't had to be a continent yet, but I bet they would. Mm-hmm. But I, I just kind of made a joke of it then after a while holly used to want to hit marty can i hit marty and i'd say you can't hit him because then i might get in trouble for not taking care of my kids when you're 18 get an apartment invite him over there and hit him over there (laughs) and so that became a joke between them holly would say i can't wait to be 18 as an expression of frustration to marty and one time marty did something really kind of you know tacky to her like you know poked her something and ran jumped away from her out of reach and said i'm not coming to your 18th birthday party (laughs) so for them that was a way to let some steam off acknowledge that they would like to hit each other but they knew they weren't going to but when kirby and marty especially would fight they would get into a real uh physical thing once in a while um i would it was almost always in Kirby's room and it almost always involved a computer, sometimes mm-hmm. sometimes toys. But it was probably a video game or a computer because in those days, you know, with dial up and all of that, it wasn't as easy to ha- every, have everybody have something they could do at the same time. Yeah. And so I, I came up with a system that worked really well. And then I had told it one time and Joyce saved it. And it's, it's on my site now. It's called Peace Slash Fighting. So if they were fighting, I would go in there, and I knew from my own experience that if you ask what happened with both people there, it it just continues the fight. It makes it worse. They just continue to say what they're going to say and yell at each other and start crying. So I didn't want to do that. So I would separate them. One of my best ways to get one kid out was to ask them to go feed the dog, check the mail, something real and physical that got them out away from there with something physical to do that I knew was going to take at least 20 seconds or a minute, you know, a little bit of time Mm -hmm. so that they breathe so that they go and they get something else in their line of vision. And I would ask one of them first, what happened? And he'd tell me that side. And then I'd go to the other one and say, okay, uh, what happened? And he would tell me without that other person in the room, there are a lot of advantages to that. One of them was I could, I could say to Marty, yeah, it's really irritating when Kirby does that, isn't it? Without saying it in front of Kirby. Or if yep. Marty was out of the room, I could say, Kirby, you know what? He's he's little. Just give him a break. So and it was a little bit of coaching. And very often their stories didn't match. So I would do one more round, you know, of, of go to the other one and go, well, Kirby says you hit him first. And he goes, well, that's true. But, you know, so I would let them express themselves separately. But then I would say, okay, did you talk about it first? Because this was the procedure, three-part procedure. Talk about it. Get a grown-up's help, then hit him. Mm -hmm. So they would say, no, we didn't. I said, okay, well, next time you need to talk about it. And if that doesn't work, come get me. And so it helped me and probably, I suppose it helped them, but it helped me a lot because I wasn't saying, I told you not to hit him. Okay, now what? If he hit him and there's a rule against hitting, now I need to do something. Or else I'm I'm aiding and abetting. I'm saying, well, yeah, you hit him, but oh, well, see you guys. So what I did was I turned it into a procedure that they could use other places and in their future lives that if you feel like hitting somebody, first say so. Say, I'm really angry. We need to do something. And if that doesn't work, get help. A grown-up's help, I guess, when you're adults is to get a friend to help mediate or to call the police. Mm-hmm. And then if, if, if other people cannot help you, then hit him. So that gave them hope. <laughs> the same way the other th- that, gave them hope <laughs> that when they grew up, they could get away from this person forever. This gave them hope that there was a legal, legitimate way to punch this guy if only they followed the procedure. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, the procedure never got past uh, get a grown-up's help 
to that point, but they didn't know that. It took them a while to figure mm-hmm. that out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to say, the uh, talking to them separately, that was a, a huge thing here as well. I mean, um, you are just, um, you know, making, well, here anyway, uh, the situation, if you try to talk to um, everybody who's involved at the same time, you know, let's all sit down and work this out together. It just escalates and escalates because each one are trying, like you said, they, they see it from their own perspective, right? right. They have their story on, on what went on. And so they're just going to keep arguing, trying to get their point heard. So yeah, I too um, found things for for them to do or places for them to go just just even for a little bit and talk to each of them individually because then yes you can you can validate and completely understand the one that you're talking to and then you know two or three rounds you can also eventually you can explain the other person's perspective as well so they they get to know and understand their siblings a bit better too so that you know next not next time but you know over time they start to notice those patterns and those personality pieces from their siblings and that really helped them eventually learn ways to work things out uh, together i've also seen my kids help other friends yeah exactly uh, get through yeah. problems there was one single time that i didn't have a good way to separate them and i was trying to get ready for us to all go somewhere and Holly, was, we were already at this house, so Marty was at least nine. He was probably nine or ten. And I just like, I was frazzled. It's like, we have to be somewhere at a certain place. The stuff's not in the van. Not, you know, Holly doesn't have her shoes or whatever, right? One of those moments, you know, yep, yep. you have three kids. And so I said, Marty, sit right there and watch that TV show until it's over. This is like 15 minutes left of some program. And mm-hmm. he said, I don't want to watch. I said, I don't care if you want to watch it. Just sit there <laughs> and watch TV. And as I walked away, he's like sitting there. It's like the closest thing to a timeout I think I ever did. And, <laughs> and it was watch TV whether you want to or not. <laughs> but that would keep him in that room. And the other kids were upstairs. And then, you know, when, when the 15 minutes were up, we all get in the van. We're all happy. It wasn't like a punishment. But as, I, as he was down there watching TV against his will, I was thinking, man – if a family really does not want their kids to watch TV, the probably best thing they could do is to make them watch TV. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be sneaking away from it, sneaking it off, begging not to have to watch TV. Don't make me, don't make me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I never did that again. But I remember it because it was so weird. Yeah, yeah. Those things stick out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to question number four. Um, as your children got older and spent more time in activities in the community, what were some of the differences that you started to notice between the schooled and the unschooled kids? Well, Holly especially was very impatient with school kids. She didn't know what it was. She didn't know what factors it was, but she went to a karate class and she complained that the other kids didn't pay attention. They weren't serious. They weren't really trying. She was in a dance class and, and the kids didn't come prepared. They didn't learn their lines for a little show they were doing. Holly knew everybody's lines, and she went to a theater group, and same thing. Why don't they know their lines? Holly couldn't even read, and she knew everybody's lines. <laughs> so for her, she just didn't want to participate in things where everyone else wasn't really serious, too. Mm-hmm. And I tried about the karate class to explain to her. I said, some of these kids didn't even probably really want to take karate, but their parents want them to. And so they bring them here after school and the kids are tired. And to her, it probably just sounded like blah, blah, blah. Me making excuses for these rotten kids. (laughs) But for me, what I noticed with the kids who came over, because a lot of them were homeschooled. We had a lot of homeschool friends, some unschooled friends from that babysitting co-op. And some Mm -hmm. of the kids did go to school and they would make friends other places and bring them home from other activities they had. The school kids wouldn't make eye contact with me. And sometimes they wouldn't even talk to me directly with me standing right in the kitchen. They would say things like, ask your mom if we can have some ice cream. <laughs> like, Hello, mm-hmm. yeah. I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, that always seemed to me the biggest difference. And as they got older boys, as they were coming into puberty, the unschooled boys would introduce themselves to adults and stick their hands out, you know, shake hands or say something interesting and appropriate. And the other kids would avoid it. They just would act like the adults weren't there. And I had seen that behavior when I was a teacher of the teachers being kind of like buildings or furniture more than like other humans. 
Yeah, I, I noticed the same thing too. Like Liz, Lizzie would be doing um, projects in uh, Pathfinders and Girl Guides and stuff. And she was always flabbergasted that, you know, none of the other kids would actually, you know, participate and and put any effort into it. And she would end up doing it and presenting it. And, you know, they, they would love that she did all the work, but <laughs> she thought that was strange that they were there. But didn't really want to participate. And we saw the same thing in karate too. And in fact, um, people know, people know Mike now on the karate tournament circuit, because in his group, his age group, he will always walk up and introduce himself and, you know, welcome people, new people to the tournaments and stuff. So, uh, he's well known for, for that. You must have taught him to do that. I'm joking. (laughs) No, exactly. (laughs) Well, that's it. When when some of the karate moms will come up and, you know, they, you know, they all talk about how um, dedicated Michael is to karate and how much he pays attention and how hard he works in class and everything. And I really think they think it's because I have taught him and told him he needs to do all these things. These are the way he needs to behave. And it's just fun in my mind to imagine that it's the total lack of it. Mm. And him finding something that he loves so much that he's going to do that. Oh my! You know what I mean? Oh, Marty, when he was 14, went to a junior police academy. It was a week long, all day, every hour they did a different activity of things that they actually teach at the police academy. And they, they made them run and march. And, you know, it was they tried to make it really physical and a little difficult. But still, the kids were 12, 13, and 14. And we didn't know about it until Marty was 14. So I really mm-hmm. wanted to get him in there. And at the end of the week... There was a dinner for the parents and little awards ceremony for the boys and stuff. And one of the – I introduced myself to one of the teachers, one of the sergeants, and he awkwardly stumbled to stand up. You know, like he's just so excited that I – he said, you're Marty's mom? And (laughs) Keith and I were standing there, and he stood up, and he said, Martin was wonderful this week. He was so enthusiastic and helpful, and, you know, he just went on and on, the kind of stuff I was used to hearing. But he said at the end, he said, you can always tell when a kid is from a from a home with a lot of rules and discipline. Ah! <laughs> and I and I opened my mouth like to say something right. And Keith like touched me like, don't, don't. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, gosh. it's amazing. So, yeah, yeah, I didn't teach him to do that. I taught him not to. I I. I I didn't teach him not to. I didn't give him the opportunity to learn to avoid and to shirk and to slough. Well, yeah, because you're not um, expecting them or or making them do things that they don't want to do. I mean, I think that's maybe one of the reasons why um, unschooling kids just look so strange. Like conventional people have a hard time imagining. I did too. Well, yeah. (laughs) It surprised me. I mean, didn't, well, didn't it's true. Things, me right? It's another one of those in re- retrospect. Yeah, yeah. We look yeah, back and see all of these, all of these patterns. But when it was coming up every time, it was like, oh wow, that surprises me. Yeah. Because I think, oh, excuse me. I think one way you can tell a, a kid is from a home with a lot of rules and discipline is that when they get away from that home, they get wild and loud and sneaky. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I treasure that little speech. But it also bothers me with its unfairness that 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 someone who's who professionally works with kids, those guys were volunteers too. That was like on on their vacation weeks. They weren't getting paid to do that police mm-hmm. academy. They just thought it was a cool thing to do. And mm-hmm. like there might have been different guys, different days, whatever. But um, they work with kids. They work with that junior police academy. They work in the school some. You know, they're out in the community. They see all these kids who are in trouble and not in trouble. And he was sure that Marty's behavior came from rules and discipline. Mm-hmm. So that's another thing I'll just probably think about till I die because it's baffling and funny and interesting and impressive. Yeah. <laughs> but mostly baffling. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That almost speechless, right? Because yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's it's just it so goes against you know what the what conventional thinking is about, and and you know then you feel bad for all the other kids who you know we've we basically by the envi- school environment and and the conventional parenting you know advice that everyone's following have created that attitude. 
that's not, you know, the attitude that children are born with. I think that's what's so flabbergasting sometimes. Right. Anyway. That without, without stepping away from it. Yeah. Who, and who was ever brave enough to step away from it until lately? So I'm glad mm-hmm. that they're, that, that what we're doing is, is probably not ever going to be accepted as a control group because no one will believe it. Just like, uh, there, that professor in Australia, I don't know if you've seen that interview of me being interviewed along with a guy who's, who was just swearing that no one could learn to read without a professional. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying, but my kids did. So all he think, he said I was not telling the truth. He said, no, they didn't. Someone taught them. Uh, so if you've already decided that, you know, X creates Y and, and, uh, and uh, it won't matter if a thousand people come and say we didn't have X and we still got Y, they'll say, no, you didn't. Yeah, so they I got X behind your back. <laughs> I, I, I don't know exactly. I don't know how how long it will take for our kids to be grown and to be voters or whatever school board members to the point that it's accepted and known that there are people who grew up without that and that they're fine. I don't know if it'll ever happen. I don't know if there are enough of them or what, but it's it's very interesting to watch. It is interesting. All right. We should probably keep going <laughs> or we could talk about that all day. But OK, question number five. Uh, one topic that pops up pretty regularly in unschooling groups is online safety. There's a lot of fear that's wrapped up in there. How did you handle that? We had one computer for the longest time and would take turns. A person's turn, including mine, was as long as they wanted. And then when they were done, they passed it to the next person. We had a rotation. And if that person didn't want to turn, they skipped. But that way, people didn't have to get off the computer. And so when that happened, we were also sharing a computer, and you could see what the other people had been doing pretty much. As the kids got older, we had two computers, and Marty was sharing mine. And that was still dial-up days, too. I had one of those big, mm-hmm. bubbly-looking iMacs, I remember. So I yeah. came in one morning, and there's some pop-up nasty porn sites there. Mm-hmm. So I said, Marty, <laughs> were you using this computer last night? Yeah, um, I need to talk to you later today. And I was busy, and I didn't know exactly what I was going to say. And I said, we need to talk about this. So I talked to some friends of mine, like, what do I say? What do I not say? How big a deal do I make? And Keith said, don't make a big deal. And I, I was always kind of aware by then, by the time my kids were older, 13, 14, I was always aware that other people were paying attention to what I was doing too. And I was kind of on stage a little bit. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, oh, I got to do the, the best thing here. <laughs> and so then I kind of forgot about it. And Marty came back and said, oh, people had said, you got to tell them that it's illegal for an adult to know that they're doing it and not stop it. You know, like you can't look at it with them. And don't forget to tell him about, you know, you have a little sister and the effect on women. And so I, I had this speech. I, okay, okay, okay. I won't forget. But then I forgot the whole thing. And Marty came to me late in the day and said, Mom, you said you needed to talk to me. Poor guy. I had been agitating about it all yeah, all day. You know, really feeling bad. So there's an account of that on my site. That's the worst thing that ever happened. And it turns out that he was trying to settle a bet that had come up during a game. They were playing table games at our house or at the gaming shop one. And one of the boys said, there's porn about everything. And another guy said, no, there's not. And these are teenage, young teens. Yeah. And one of them said, yes, there is. And he said, there's not any porn about centaurs. <laughs> Guess what? There is. So Marty said, yes, there is. So Marty was looking for centaur porn. And when you touch any porn sites, you, get, you can get pop-ups. So it's not as bad these days, I suppose. But in those days of early internet, it was hard to undo. Yeah. But earlier than that, a couple of years before that, I came in and there was this really cool little message on the computer of two teenagers, Marty and his friend. So you think two, I guess they were like 12 and 15, 13, 15. And they, what would boys like that age talk about at night when all their parents are asleep? You know, something terrible, right? This is what it said. Um, Marty had written, you coming down? And Brett wrote, yeah. Marty wrote, did you know Canada has prime ministers? Brett wrote, yeah. (laughs) Marty wrote, dude. (laughs) That was the conversation. So Marty, that same day, the reason he wanted Brett to come over is that Marty was going to meet this girl, um, <clears throat> I think, no, I think that's a different story because that was at the mall, but they were going to meet some kids at the park just to play in the daytime in a park, um, playing or just, you know, to goof around. And they mm-hmm. said, here are the cell phones we'll have and we're going to go. So 
that's what those kids were doing. It wasn't anything sneaky. It was all very upfront. And I have a page on my site called Online Safety. Whenever I say called, that means center.com slash. I tried to make a lot of them guessable. So if you look up reading or math or whatever, it'll be there. And Online Safety has really nice set of writings by various people that I've collected. But my main point in there is why would a child want to meet a stranger at a bus station or behind a bowling alley and go with him? What conditions would be required for someone to think that was a good idea? Home mm -hmm. life would have to be terrible. So if the parents are people that the children like to live with, want to be around, trust, can talk to, then how can any crazy weirdo on the internet lure them away? Yep. So yeah, and online on top safety starts with the relationships between the parents and the children. Yep. And when you're, you know, as unschooling parents, when you're supporting and helping them, like I've helped my children, kids meet um, up with people they've met on the internet. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like when they, when they've connected with, I mean, that's how I met unschoolers face to face for the first time. Right. You know, when they, when they don't have to sneak, when they can get your help, you can help them navigate that whole thing, you know, and, and talk about, you know, the safety aspects, the possibilities, setting up ways um, for meetings to be done safely, you know, with, with parents there, having them over to your place. You know, there's just a million ways to work through things rather than just saying no and refusing and then basically forcing them if they need to, to have to go behind your back. I was mixing that story up with another one, but the other one is uh, kids that they had met through a gaming forum that AOL had. And, and they found out they were in the same town, so they wanted to meet. And there was a girl who liked Marty online, I guess. You know, whatever, their characters yeah. in the game. Yep. So they were going to go and meet at the big mall. And, and it wasn't just her and it wasn't just Marty. She brought her three or four friends and he brought his three or four friends and they all hung around. It's like Marty and the girl on a date with six chaperones or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't like a date at all, really. It was just them hanging out at the mall. And after a while, they, you know, they didn't really hit it off, but that... Nobody was – there was nothing to be mean or embarrassed or rude about. They just kept hanging out until they didn't. And and it seems like as good a situation as anyone could imagine or design or write. It was just very civilized, even though they were 13 or 14. And I, I'm, I've been so proud of my kids for having the awareness – that when you're in a situation like that, safety is a factor, courtesy is a factor, making sure that other people know where you are and how you're going to get home is a factor. And those were routine things. They were not unusual. There was no threat. There was no punishment. And when I was a kid, it was always, you can go here if, 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 and if you're not home by exactly this time, then you're grounded. You know, there was all this background of distrust and, and disapproval. Yep rules instead of you know those those are things one does when you care about the relationship you know and when you trust each other right I, versus having it implemented as a rule and distrust I mean you're trying to get to the same things but you're coming at, a, at them from completely different perspectives I think all the kids who went with Marty were unschoolers now that I'm thinking mm -hmm. of that of those days and, and so those kids all had that awareness too it's like we're helping Marty if Marty had yeah. said, I like this girl, you guys go, you know, do something and leave, leave us alone, they would have. They would have, you know, they, it wasn't a predecided plan. It was flexible because they were all thinking people and, and there was an awareness that I think school kids can sometimes have, but in general, probably don't. Don't, yeah. And, and I would imagine that if, uh, one or two of those friends felt that the situation seemed weird when Marty asked, they would, you know, mention oh, their yeah. concerns oh, yeah. to him because <laughs> it was totally open, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Very cool. Okay, let's move to question number six because there's another essay of yours that I love, which is called uh, Public School on Your Own Terms. And in it, you talk about how even if unschooling isn't an option for a family at any particular time, there are still ways to lessen the power that school exerts over their lives. So I was hoping you could share some of those ideas. Since I wrote that, 
the school funding in a lot of states in the U.S., I don't know how it is in Canada and other places, has changed. It used to be that funding went in once or twice a year. Like they would do a, a sort of a, what do you call, census. Like which, which kids are in which schools on this day, October 1st or whatever day it was. And then yeah. they got their funding for the semester. But they changed it probably thanks to computers and the ability to change it to day by day. So they get their money by how many people are there that day. So that is called school – that has caused the schools – to crack down on family vacations and anything like that, uh, taking kids mm -hmm. out because they're losing money by the day. So uh, some of the ideas may not be as workable, but what I was trying to say was even if a child is in school, the parents don't have to absolutely buy in and become the lieutenants of the school captains. They don't have to enforce the school's rules. They don't have to pressure the children to the wall about homework or grades. They can calmly, if they can manage it, say, if you don't want to do your homework, you might get bad grades. Is that all right with you? You know, I don't care if, mm -hmm. if you don't care. And if the parents can divorce themselves emotionally from that pressures of school and help the child as much as he wants to, you know, not, I don't, I don't think anyone should um, sabotage or undermine what the child wants to do. But I also don't think that they need to totally partner up with the school to torment a child who doesn't want to be there. So if there's any hesitation or the child is not an academic kid, then the parents could ameliorate some of the damage, cushion it by their own kindness and acceptance of lower grades or not getting awards or not making the team, whatever it is in that family that might have been uh, hugely important otherwise. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What else yeah. do you remember from that? Is there something else? I can say? <laughs> yeah, no, I think that was a, that was a big piece of it for me is, is, you know, it, it's helping the parents move beyond the fact that, that, um, though that the grades and the achievements within the school environment really aren't, um, a useful, useful is probably a good word, a useful way to judge your child. Right. I mean, yes. And there's there's no it's it's just a small piece of who they are. And school need only be a small uh, a piece, you know, a few some hours a day that they go to. But that all that that rest of the time, your evenings and weekends and summer vacations, um, you can still be doing the things that they enjoy doing, you know, uh, supporting their interests and passions and doing fun things with them. Even if you can't, as you say, take them out of school on school days as much, right? Right. But you can still support them as a person and <laughs> and uh, treat them that way and say, you know, and support them, as you said, as much as they want with the school stuff. But, you know, stick up for them. I was just, I'm just editing a little piece this morning that was taking me back to when Joseph was in school before I discovered homeschooling. And, you know, I, it was reminding me how much I stood up for him within the school, you know, um, as much as they were trying to complain. And I know they kept trying to get me on their side yeah. so that I would come home and, and, you know, put he, punish him. He was suspended once for something. And, you know, I totally understood his, his point of view and we talked about it and everything. And then, you know, he enjoyed his two days or whatever it was, you know, I wasn't going to <laughs> stand over and make him feel horrific for what had happened. It's like, yeah, you know, this happened, dude. <laughs> The way to earn you a know, vacation from school. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, yeah, you don't need to become the school police at home. You know, you can, you can be your child's uh, advocate all the time. <laughs> but anyway, the yeah. That, told me early on when I was a kid, if you get in trouble at school, you'll be in more trouble at home. My yeah. mom, I shouldn't say my parents, my mom. And I didn't get in trouble much. But I did when I was 15, I smarted off to the teacher and it's a good story too long for this. When my mom came in, she was prepared to be new, at least neutral, you know, at least to hear their side. But the principal was addressing her in a very smarmy way. And he was going, well, mother, we both know <laughs> that. And so she hated him right off the bat. He called her, her mother like three times. Mm. And I thought, 
if she if she doesn't get out of here pretty soon, she's going to do and say way worse than I did. <laughs> but uh, that teacher, the teacher that I I just embarrassed the teacher because he said something wrong and I pointed out and he tried to defend himself and I said, oh brother. So that was my sin was saying oh brother to a teacher. But we were yeah. friendly. That teacher and I we were still friends later on. And when I went back and taught, you know, so it, it didn't destroy my relationship with him. Hmm. That's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, question number seven. Uh, your children have taken some college courses over the years. I know I've seen seen some stories about that. Can you share a couple of them yeah, with the, the listeners? The very first one was when Kirby, Kirby just wanted to go try it out just to see if he liked it, see if it's something he wanted to do. And he took three classes, I think, but just easy, easy beginning things. And there was another boy there, an unschooler we, who his mo- his mom was one of my first La Leche League letters, leaders, Le- La Leche League leaders. His name is <laughs> Liam. Too many L's here. I've made myself a tongue twister. Should I start over? <laughs> nope, that one. Liam is on my website uh, in one of the reading stories because he didn't learn to read till he was 16. Ah. He was a he was one of a set of twins at the time. The mom said, I feel like he's quite much more premature than his sister. And in those days... Doctors and the you know medical professionals, the officials used to say that doesn't happen. You don't get pregnant when you're pregnant. And then 15 <laughs> years later, they said, oh, guess what? People can get pregnant when they're already pregnant. And all those women with those kinds of sets of twins went, yeah, we know. Oh. So he was a preemie with a very verbal sister and a very verbal reading older brother. And so that didn't help him either. Right. I mean, not only could he not read, everybody else else was showing him over and over he couldn't read. So he just didn't try after a while. But anyway, he did learn to read. And then he was at the community college with Kirby and they both got awards um, at this, you know, for the for the incoming first year kids. I went down to the little ceremony and they got certificates for being enthusiastic or, you know, being the being the most attentive students. And one of the classes they took was, oh, Liam, the reason Liam went, Kirby went just to check it out. Liam went because he wanted to be a Marine. His dad had been a Marine and he wanted to join the Marines. But you had to either have high school diploma or 15 hours of college credit. So he needed to go down there and take five hours, five classes. Mm -hmm. So that's what Liam was doing. But one of the classes they took together was something like how to succeed in college. So it was a class about how to study. And I know when I was in school and they taught us how to study, it bugged me all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, here's how to organize your notebook. Here's how to organize your time. Man, man, I take notes (laughs) like this. But these guys who had not been to school at all are going, this stuff's great. (laughs) (laughs) So I think uh, probably the person who taught that class had never seen anyone bright-eyed and enthusiastic. So uh, he scrambled (laughs) to get them awards. Uh, uh, Kirby had taken the AccuPlacer test, which is – I don't know how standard that is, how broad that is. But in New Mexico, when you go to a community college, you just sit down at a computer and take a test. And it's for math and English. What it's for is to see whether you can take the college level, like English 101, the first level class, or whether you need to take remedial first and not get credit for it. Mm -hmm. These... These little community colleges are free. It's like public school continued. The books are expensive, but the I don't think there's tuition. If there is, it's very low. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's tuition now, but at the time Kirby went, it, there wasn't. So these guys are just like kind of just going to school for the first time. So he took the AccuPlacer test and he tested into English. So his English was as good as they expect anyone's English to be to go to college when he had not had any any training past hanging out, you know, reading and writing and playing games, reading game rules is probably the, the highest level English he did because he taught at a, he worked at a gaming store from the time he was 14 and, and their, their motto was, we teach the games we sell. Mm. And he had run a lot of tournaments. He had judged tournaments at Magic, Magic and uh, some other cards on ta- tables, table games, tournaments in those days so that's kind of like being a lawyer <laughs> it's not like it's not like being a referee at a sports event because you have to know all the rules but anyway he he tested into english 101 but in the math there are five levels of remedial math and he tested into the third one so he's in the middle that didn't bother me mm-hmm. at all i'm i was impressed that he wasn't at the beginning because they didn't read the language of math they could do it in their heads but in english or with a calculator or whatever but they didn't read formulas on paper yeah, And so it'd be like no one would ever have said that Paul McCartney wasn't a musician when he had Grammys and, you know, Bedillion gold albums, but he couldn't read music till he was in his 40s and he went and learned to read music. So you don't have to read 
English to speak well. You don't have to have taken a bunch of grammar classes to write well. You don't have to know mathematical notation to be mathematical. Who knew that? How are you going to know that if kids don't start taking math classes when they're five or six? So it turns out (laughs) that you can know a lot about it. So Kirby goes in there. He doesn't know the language, and he's in a remedial class. The first week, he was totally frustrated, had no idea what they were talking about, and Keith and I tried to help him, and that just made it worse. The second week, he got a gamer friend of his to help explain it to him. And that he could he could hear he could hear his friend helping him yeah and the third week he was all caught up so 13 years all those other kids have gone to school kirby mm-hmm. has gone to school now for 2 weeks and he's caught yeah. up yeah wow and so eight cl- that was eight classes because it was monday through thursday so i suppose 8 hours of math instruction plus plus getting help at home so let's say maybe generously 15 hours and still he's in a remedial class someone online uh badmouthed me behind my back and said oh sandra better 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 her kids in remedial math and i said when somebody sent it to me i said yes with a couple of hundred other people all of whom went to school (laughs) so (laughs) i i don't get what you're saying here so the third week he was caught up and at the end, he had the highest final test score and the second highest overall score in the class. Not because <laughs> yeah. he was being competitive, not because we were going to give him money if he got an A or anything, just because he, once he got to doing it, he was going to do it. If he mm-hmm. voluntarily went there to do it, he was going to do it. And he did. So Marty, though. Marty is the one who's gone to school more than any of them. They've all gone to school. I think Holly... I don't know. I'm, I don't want to mess up a story here because she'll hear it and tell me I messed it up. <laughs> I can't remember the Holly math, but they've all taken they've all, all taken math classes and they're all good at that sort of thing. But Marty loved the economics classes over there, but he's shy. And and I would say, have you told him that you that you were homeschooled? And he goes, no, no, I didn't ask and it didn't come up. And he was just shy to ask questions. He still is, I think, to not so much now, mm-hmm. but he would take two classes at a time and be working full time. On top of that, and he took the third economics class they had there. They had intro, macroeconomics, microeconomics. That's all they have at the community college. He has to go to UNM, which he's going to. So he's going to go to UNM next year and finish taking what else he can of economics because he just loved it. But he liked the teacher a lot. And even though he wasn't willing to stay after class to talk to him, he – or go to office hours, there was a party. They, all the students were invited to a party, and Marty went. Mm -hmm. That's brave for Marty. And then he was in an Eastern religions class there. I think it was anthropology, probably. And as a final project, they had to do something, some sort of show and tell thing. And Marty decided he would do uh, Ganesha Puja, like a a little little, um, altar set up, a little worship of Ganesha, the elephant-headed guy. Mm -hmm. So Marty has always liked him and had art in his room and a, and a batik wall hanging of Ganesha in his room. So that was kind of obvious that that's where Marty would go if he could. So I had visited in India with Ravi and Hema Bardwaj, mm-hmm. and they uh, – every morning that I was there, Ravi came down, took a shower, came down uh, before, he got, before he got all dressed and uh, did his puja, did set up the altar and did his little worship. I didn't go stand and look at him. Uh, but I could kind of see him, you know, from the other room, and I was aware that he was doing it, and, and the altar's in the kitchen, and it wasn't a hidden thing or anything. Yeah. So I told Marty, you, you could ask Ravi. I've, you know, I've, I've seen him do this. And, and I told Ravi he was doing it because I, I was making flowers for the little thing he had. I was doing a – I had seen people do flowers in India with a needle and thread. So I wanted to make sure I was doing something reasonable helping Marty mm-hmm. set up. And Ravi said, tell him I'll Skype with him. I'll show him. He can watch me do it. And Marty said, no, no, no. And when Marty was really interested in economics, I said, why don't you talk to Pam? Marty knows Pam Sarushi, and he's known her since he was little. And he goes, no, I don't want to bug her. No, no, I don't want to ask her. So I just thought it was interesting that having these real legitimately earned resources uh, in other unschooling families, in other countries, in other states, Marty, knowing that he had that resource, was okay to opt out. And it wasn't mm-hmm. the same energy as a as a as a back to the school kid difference. It wasn't that energy of no, I don't want to help or no, that's stupid. It was just like I don't want to bother them. No, I'm embarrassed. I'm shy. 
Yeah. So no, so he is even turning down resources, even though it might have gotten him a better grade or whatever, just because he actually had the real choice to get this extra very cool help or not. Yeah, not and the self-awareness, right? That's yeah. that self-awareness yeah. piece. Yeah. But that, that must have made him cool. feel good that he, he did, he pulled it off. And the way he did it was, he just told me about it, but he took all of the supplies. We went to an Indian grocery store near us and talked to that guy too. And he sold us a couple of things that we could use. So Marty said, if I were in India, if I were Hindu, and if I were doing this, here's what I would have done. So he did it, but partly he was talking. He was talking it through. Mm-hmm. He said, I would have cleaned the house. I would have just taken a shower and, you know, and it would, yeah. and it would be morning. And then, and then he set up the altar. So I think that's that was very cool, very cool. And I, it was interesting to me because I wanted him to take advantage of these resources, you know, of these people. I just thought it would be fun for them, too, to know mm-hmm. that Marty was doing this. But he's not as shy as he used to be because in the, in the SCA, in the Society for Creative Anachronism, he, was, he became the local baron. And so he sits up in front and he makes speeches and gives awards and hears people's problems. So that has caused him a lot of... Courage <laughs> that gave him a lot of a lot of ability to speak off the cuff, and that's that's helped more than any class in public speaking would have, I'm sure, or organization or management. Yeah, because that's something he was interested in pursuing, right? Yeah, yeah, that's very cool. All right, let's move to question number eight. Uh, I'm curious, what life's like for you and your husband now that all your children have moved out? Um, can you still feel the influence of the unschooling lifestyle in your days? Well, it's kind of hard to say when they all moved out because <laughs> <laughs> Kirby Kirby got a, was offered a job in Texas when he was just about to turn 21. So he was 20 and he was moving to Texas and he had worked a lot. Kirby worked a lot from the time he was 14 and so he wasn't home so much because he was working. He was some of the time doing karate, not that last couple of years, and teaching there. And um, when he moved, he was gone, like almost suddenly to Texas mm-hmm. and was there for eight years. Marty stayed here until he was 24 and then moved to our old house. It's 23, 24. And Holly left when she was 17, has been in and out, in and out. She'll be gone for a few months and back in. But then they were all gone. They were legitimately, all of them lived in other places. And Keith retired a year ago. And so it was just me and Keith in this big house. And we got ourselves a really nice routine where we would go out to eat late in the like middle of the afternoon and come home and take a nap. And it was so nice. And then within a month of that, Kirby said, I think I want to move back to Albuquerque with my girlfriend and her daughter. And can we stay with you at first until we find a place? (laughs) (laughs) So yes, I'm, I was glad to help Kirby, but it was like, wait, wait, wait. We just started our paradise retirement. (laughs) So (laughs) that didn't last all that long, but Kirby has moved to a house nearby and we have the house to ourselves again. I like it. I enjoy it. But the, the kids are still, they, one or two of them, usually talk to us every day and we're still helping them do things. The most unschooling like story of it all though, was when Keith first retired, he told me he did not know what he wanted to do. He'd been reading articles about how much damage retirement can do to some people's mental health Mm -hmm. and their relationships. And he didn't want to screw anything up. And he just had no plans whatsoever. And people kept saying, what are your plans? And he said, I don't know. He said, I want to, I want to take a month for every year that I worked to just be here. So it's like ah. old de-schooling uh, <laughs> uh, to take a month for every year that you were in school or involved with school. And so he knew that. He'd seen that work with people. And, he, and he, that's what he said he wanted to do about retirement is to take all that time. And so the, he still got a, another year and a half then by that formula, almost three years. <laughs> and brilliant. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I just said brilliant because that's awesome. <laughs> it's a great way to look at it. I think uh, the unschooling still shows in the effect on our relationship because we don't pressure each other to do things or do things differently or change or not have our hobbies. Or I think we learned with the kids that if you just accept people's quirks and messes and 
weird sudden urges to go and do something, if you go with it instead of against it, it's better. And so that's been that way with us too. I, I think each of us is more kind, more accepting than we might have been if we hadn't just finished these entire kids' childhoods of learning and practicing being that way with the kids. It, yeah, because you, you learn about the how to how to be in relationship with people, right? And then eventually you realize it's it's about relationship with people, not just children. Yeah. Yeah. And it changed us. It mm-hmm. changed us as individuals too. We we are nicer and more patient people because we've got to practice on our kids. And it stays with other relationships and just inside you, even when you're by yourself. Uh, more accept, I'm more accepting of my own self, of my own unfinished projects. I can tell myself, don't look at what you didn't do, look at what you did do. Mm-hmm. Things like that. Yep. Number nine. We're getting there, we're getting there. Uh, you continued volunteering your time and effort in the unschooling community. You're still answering questions online every day. You're speaking. You send out your Ad Light and Stir blog posts every day. You maintain your extensive and amazing website. And that's awesome for all of us in the unschooling community. I'd love to hear what has drawn you to stay involved even after your children have become adults. I, I think about that sometimes and I, I don't always know. I, I suppose there are a lot of factors, but just as with my kids, we didn't decide one day that Kirby would be home for the next 13 years. It was just like he's not going to go to kindergarten. Mm-hmm. So it was. I think it was like that too. The first time I spoke was for a very local um, parenting gathering, like a one-day thing of workshops, and they asked me to speak about homeschooling, and the other things were about breastfeeding or you know whatever all else that parents talk about kids snacks. <laughs> and <laughs> that was the first time. And then I spoke at a state homeschooling conference. And then because um, the HSC group, I guess that there was another little New Mexico thing, but you know, I spoke in New Mexico with friends of mine who were organizing things. And then I guess in California, they said, well, who's ever spoken about homeschooling? And I was, I was active in AOL then, and I had, I had spoken. So I got to speak in California. That was 20 years ago. And I only figured that out yesterday because it was 1996. I went back to count how many times I had spoken in at HSC events because I'm speaking uh-huh. again this end of July. And I've spoken 10 times counting a symposium they did, and that's 20 years. So that's kind of cool that it's an anniversary. Mm-hmm. I, w- I wouldn't have noticed if I hadn't gone back to <laughs> say something clever in my little bio intro. <laughs> so it, it was gradual, but I never there never was a point, again, with the theme of this whole – discussion here. Looking back, I see it clearly. Looking forward, I didn't know anything. Looking forward, it's like, I'm going to do this thing tomorrow. I'm going to do this thing next month. I'm mm-hmm. going to set up a web page. The first time I got to make a web page was a thing called XPage. Crummy, dirty little free web pages with little ad banner at the top. And you could only have so many keystrokes. It was like a number of, you know, bytes that you could have there. Uh-huh. And no way could you have a photo. That didn't exist in those days, uploading a photograph. You could have yeah. little line drawings that, you know, clip art. And, ASCII art, yeah. And if I wanted to put a new piece of uh, information on there, I would have to take words out. There were some links that we kept sending to people, so I just wanted to have a place to put those links. And it, eventually it became, I went to GeoCities, Yahoo Small Business long story. But anyway, these are websites that you can have unlimited pages. So the first many pages were articles that I had written or lists that people had made, lists of quotes. But nowadays, if I had a new page, it's usually because the discussion just blossomed beautifully and people with experience have written some stuff that is so beautiful, somebody needs to save it. Mm -hmm. So I keep adding pages and there are almost 2,000 of them now. And by page, of course, you know, I know not a page like a piece of paper, but a URL. Some yep. of those, if you hit print, it's going to go 12, 13, 15 pages. Mm-hmm. It doesn't look like it when you're reading it online, but it's a <laughs> lot of information. Someone to insult me one time said that I seemed like I was building the Wikipedia of unschooling. And I'm like, yeah, well, so, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I am. I didn't mean to, again, back to that. I didn't mean to, I never looked into the future and said, I'm going to speak at these conferences for 20 years. How could I have? I didn't even mm-hmm. know if my kids were going to stay home. Cause I used to say, do you still want to homeschool? You want to go home? So go to school. 
And I used to think each of them, I thought at some point, you know, they're going to want to go to school and they didn't. And that was fine. So this was no giant plan that I fulfilled. It was something that developed gradually because I think partly I like the energy of people learning things. I, and I think it, I know it. So I like that. I like it when somebody gets excited because they got it. They, they're like, mm. oh, I love that moment. And I think when I was a teacher, I was a vampire of that sort of thing. Like I told you that we, did, <laughs> we, uh, we figured out the 12 days of Christmas thing. I would do that. I would do a Mobius strip. If my kids were bored and it wasn't even a math class, if I knew something that was going to make them go, oh, I would do that. Yeah. Because while they're doing that, they're connecting. I, so I was doing that when I was teaching seventh grade. It, I suppose uh, somebody, somebody would say strewing if there were people in the room. Maybe it was that. But maybe it was just showing them things that were amazing. Mm -hmm. Showing them things that would make them go, this is cool. Now, I don't know about all this other stuff in school, but this thing you just showed me is cool. So I like that with unschooling too, helping other people get it, helping them see that they're, they don't have to just stumble along doing what they kind of vaguely think other people are doing. They can make a system for basing their decisions and their actions on new beliefs, on their new principles, on what they want their life to be like. And so when people do figure that out and then when they turn around and start helping others figure it out, I'm thrilled. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one reason I keep doing it because there keep being people come along who are excited about it. And I like their excitement. That's very cool. And I love the point about how it's not something you plan. I mean, that's the same for me when I decided to write my first book, you know, it's just, I'm, I want to gather up. It was just a challenge for me. I wanted to gather up what I had put together in my mind. I didn't say, Oh, I'm going to now create, have a career as an author and I'm going to write lots and lots of books. No, each one has just kind of come up and said, hmm, that, that makes sense. I want to do that now, you know? Right. I doubt yeah. that you said I will have three that match and then another one and then one will be in French. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. And if you had written one book and you didn't like it and people went, eh, you wouldn't have probably written another one. But it's the other people's reactions, right? It's people going, thank you. I like this. This is great. Do another one. Yeah, because because that helps you, um, I don't know, because with that feedback, you start to see uh, other places that, oh, look, there's that little piece, there's that little piece. Oh, I can tell by, you know, those questions, you get drawn to different interesting things. Like you said, you create a new page because something sparks a whole new discussion. You're like, oh, yeah, that, that is super cool. You know, I want to share that piece. Someone, so that's fun. Someone wrote to me fairly recently, and she's new to unschooling because she had just recently applied to be on uh, Always Learning and said that she'd only been unschooling for four months. So uh, she wrote to me on the side and asked me to go to her blog and read what she had written and tell her if she was on the right trail, right on the right uh, path. Mm -hmm. That's the word, right track. And I yeah. said, oh, I don't, that sounds like homework. I don't want to go read something and have to write a report. <laughs> but I said, but if you come to one of the discussions, let's discuss it all together because I don't do one-on-one -on -one help. And I have a page link that I send to people when they say, will you help me with this really long, difficult problem? And I say, no, but <laughs> come do it in a group because I want my writing to go to a lot of people. It's more efficient. Mm -hmm. If I write something really good uh, by accident in the course of, you know, writing something and it's good, I want a hundred or a thousand people to be able to see that, not one. Mm -hmm. And if somebody asks me for advice about something, they just get one person's ideas. But if they ask a group, they'll get probably five or 12 people's ideas. And if somebody makes a mistake, has a typo, there doesn't have the right uh, link, somebody else is going to correct it. So mm -hmm. as a group, they're going to build this beautiful set of ideas. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to provide for people, that opportunity to learn from a lot of people and to compare ideas that are coming through and all blah, blah, like that. But the mm -hmm. woman in pressuring me to help her said that maybe I should mentor people who are enthusiastic and young. And <laughs> I thought, uh, really? Oh, serious and enthusiastic. I don't know exactly what she said. And, I, and so because we were in writing, she didn't get the, the dropped jaw, big eyed uh, reaction of what are you talking about? <laughs> so I started thinking about who am I mentoring and the people I think I'm really mentoring are the people who are 
writing. The people whose writing gets to the point that their explanations are worth me taking to my site. So part of the mentoring is to get their names out there. And I have a lot of pages on individuals where if I've quoted them on my site 10 or 12 times, I make a directory page, introduce them, say who they are, put a photo and mm -hmm. start collecting the links there. Because sometimes somebody just really loves somebody's writing more than anybody else's. That's normal. That's natural. That's awesome. And so yeah. if they can go find uh, 15 other things by that person, that's great. In my blog collection book, um, I put a little note. Um, I said, because I rearranged uh, the essays or, or the blog posts that were in there, as well as editing them. But I said, now with this uh, new uh, way of slicing um, the stories, you might see some repetition in there. But um, it it so it can be something different. And one of those might connect, make a connection for an individual, right? Because everybody's coming at things with their own set of uh, history, environment, perspective, you know, personality, everything. So they could hear the same thing 10 different times, but maybe it's that 10th time that that really connects for them. So that's what, one of the things I love about your site is all the different little ways um, to talk about the same idea because there is one one or two ways, one or two people that may really speak closely for a certain individual. And I want to encourage those people to keep writing too. So I think that's the mentoring I'm doing. I'm helping people who are who didn't plan it and didn't apply for this job, right? They just yeah. organically and naturally and gradually fell into that role of being the first on the scene to answer a hard question and to do it very well. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Okay, we made it to question number 10. Looking back now, what for you has been the most valuable outcome from choosing and schooling? Ooh. Is this a name only one thing? Okay, the, you no, said the. you can go. You didn't say I some. did say the. <laughs> okay, here's my the. You can have a tie. Yes. Kids know that they have options. My kids know in their adult lives that they can make choices and that they can get help from their resources and that we will try to help them. That's beautiful. That really is so different, isn't it? I think so. And none of my kids have college degrees, and all of Pam Sarushian's do. That was an interesting set of kids because we met when Holly was four and Rosie was five, and it's like every other one. They line up, uh, you know, Roya, Kirby, Roxana, Marty, Rosie, Holly. <laughs> and it was fun to see them grow up so differently and know each other so well. And, and to follow them along as they, as they grew up. But all of her kids have college degrees. It was really important to Sarus that they go to college. I totally understand where he's coming from with that. And Pam worked at, at universities and her friends, they have, they have other, other adult friends who are professors too. And they were around those places and it was easy for them. My kids have always had jobs and been doing other things. And while they've all taken classes and Holly's talking about maybe going in and taking a two-year business degree at the Northern New Mexico College where she's living near now, you know, they aren't in a hurry. They don't have the idea that they might have had if they were in school that they're too old now to start college. They don't have that at all. Mm -hmm. And Marty, when he goes to UNM, will be a junior. So he's also 20 seven. But Keith, who did go to school, changed in and out of school, changed majors. He didn't get his degree till he was 29. So they have that example from in the family. Only Keith's parents probably thought he was kind of a slacker and a bum. <laughs> but, so all of, all of my kids have made more money in younger years than either Keith or I did because teaching didn't pay diddly in the 70s. And so they, they don't there's no sense in us shaming them and saying, you need to get a college degree or you can't make any money because they could say, now tell us again what you were doing when you were 23. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, they, they know because they don't have the prejudices to ignore people without degrees or to worship people with degrees. They know that there's a huge range of success in life and that happiness is more important than paper and blah, blah, blah. They know a lot of stuff that has, that I thought would just help them as unschooled kids, but it turns out it helps them as real adults. 
That's true. And, and and tying it back to your choices, that's precisely it, right? There's no um, timeline or expectations. They make the choice that works for them at the time. Lots of people... This, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this in as my number two valuable outcome. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm just Don't really hogging the air here. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people, when they're kids, vaguely or maybe specifically hope that they grow up to change the world. Mm-hmm. And Keith helped me do that by being willing to support us while we lived at home with these ideas and shared them out, tried them up, tried them out, you know, at meetups and conferences and visiting other families, having other families visit us, discussing it online. Keith didn't complain about that. He saw the value in it and knew that it was helping other people. So I got to change the world as the front man there, but Keith helped me. I couldn't have done it without Keith, without Mm -hmm. Keith agreeing that it's okay. He'd keep the kids while I went to a conference or something. And then between me and Keith, we have the solidifying and strengthening of our relationship that comes from having done something difficult together and succeeded and being able to look back at it with relief and satisfaction that our kids grew up in an odd and unusual and potentially hazardous way, (laughs) you know, no guarantees, Mm -hmm. not the school has guarantees, but you know what what I mean. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me today, Sandra. I had a great time hearing some of your stories. And before we go, where's the best place for people to connect with you online? Uh, To read my website is sandradod.com. And that has a link to Just Add Light and Stir, which I think is the best thing these days. I'm on young groups at Always Learning, an old group, probably 12 years old. And then there's a newer group on Facebook called Radical Unschooling Info. If they want to discuss, but if you just want to read or if you want to look things up, I have a great search page that covers your site, Pam, and Joyce's and mine, and it's at sandradod.com slash search. The bottom box covers those and maybe another another site or two, some of my blogs, and that's a really great place to look things up. So if people are shy and they don't want to ask their question in public or they don't like the the kinds of responses people get in discussions, if they're, they're afraid of that sort of thing, you can read for weeks, months, by that search box about anything you want to. I love that search box. <laughs> that's awesome. I love that you made it go to uh, various sites. Very cool. <laughs> all right, that's terrific. Thanks so much, Sandra. I use it all the time. Sign myself. Do you? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no. Thanks, thanks. a lot. <laughs> We're Bye. all chopped up. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. You can also get your free Exploring Unschooling ebook at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash exploring unschooling. If you'd like to connect, you can also find me on Facebook at Living Joyfully. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.